Yassine Mohammed from the University of Leiden. Please, our last speaker. Um, yeah, thanks for having me here. Um, um, just let me change this one here. So um, I work at a hospital in Leiden, and our main goal actually always to, um, to do clinical um, work. So we try to move uh, to, to do translational from mass spectrometry and what we do in mass spectrometry to, to the clinic side. Um, but first, I will show you a little bit about uh, knowledge bases that we were working um, that we're working on specifically for target proteomics. The approach is very simple. Everyone here in the audience probably know what target proteomics is. Basically, you have your protein, and then you digest it, for example, here with trypsin, and then you get like your peptides. Some of these peptides are the pro proteotypic peptides. Um, and then this is what you want to, to, uh, to target. Um, if you want to add heavy labeled uh, um, peptides with the non amount, you can do the relative quantification and then from the unknown amount of the endogenous, you can um, infer what, how, how much of that uh, peptide is in your sample, and, and f with that, how much of your proteins in the, of your protein of interest of your target protein in the sample. It's very simple on the mass spec side. It's just like adding one single step, which is adding the internal standard, and then you will get uh, absolute, uh, absolute, um, um, absolute and precise measurement. You will be specific, reproducible measure. You will have a reproducible measurement, high multiplicity, and low sample volume. The last two points are actually the main point for us in, especially in clinical chemistry. When we talk to the clinical chemist, they say this is our, uh, the, the killer point for us. Um, instead of doing one ELISA per protein, we can do now multiple, one, one measurement for multiple proteins. And that's uh, the main goal here. Um, this is more or less the, the overview. You have the pre-experimental step, you have the experiment, and then you have post-experimental step. And then targeted proteomics, we put a lot of emphasis also on the pre-experimental step in like uh, when we when we to, when we uh, contrast it with bottom normal bottom up proteomics, so we are going really targeting specific protein in advance um, rather than going blind to um, and uh, and trying to see what we want to see. When we looked at that, we did a lot of this uh, in collaboration with uh, with the lab in, uh, at UVic with the proteomics center at UVic, where Christoph uh, was heading as as well. And we looked at that and then we saw actually um, that's fantastic, but it's not only us who's doing this work, a lot of other people are doing this work and we thought, okay, let's collect all the data, put it all together in one, in one spot, make a knowledge base and not only stop there, connect the proteomics data to a lot of the data which is out there. So we don't want, we are not interested only in proteomics, we are interested in how this prote how is ex our experiment um, connected to other, other uh, um, data which was collected previously from genetics, from metabolomics, from, um, from uh, um, uh, drugs, and so on. Uh, we built the MRM SADB. It's an integrated resource for targeted proteomics assay in the whole community. We have around 840,000 assays. This is, we, we were the people who collected the data, but we were a lot of, it's, the whole, it's, a, it's, it's an approach for the whole community. The whole community was the, um, 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 was uh, or the whole community measured all these samples and um, we've just put the data all together and harmonized it and um, we connected to uh, to subcellular localization we know the PTMs on these uh, um, assays or on these peptide assays we know the best transition because we collected many many experiments and each experiment if everyone chose different peptide different uh, transition for the same peptide or different peptide for the same protein we know by comparing which peptide and which transition are the best for the, for the, for the protein. And we connect it to a lot of other databases. This is just a, a few uh, screenshots. What you can see here is that uh, we can map the data, the assays, the peptide assays to, to pathways and then see which proteins we can target in, each, in which pathway. Uh, we can map it to uh, uh, um, um, interaction databases and see which protein is interacting with which data with which protein so we can plan our our experiment in advance and cho choose the peptide the protein and their peptide assays in advance um, uh, of doing the experiment we also mapped mapped we also mapped the data to uh, all kind of uh, uh, um, modification ptms phosphorylation glycosylation we know whether the peptide whether Previously, someone saw whether there's something on, on the peptide itself, and then um, you can see also on the 3D structure where the peptide is, 
and um, also we map it to drug, uh, to drug data. Um, it's being used, a lot of people are using this uh, data and they, they are mining it actually. So we have also APIs so people can just like submit um, 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 a query um, programmatically and then collect the data and, and uh, do their local analysis. So this is one resource about MRMSADB. It's about um, targeted proteomics assay in the community. We put it together, but uh, but we what we did also is um, is uh, the mass quantitative proteomics knowledge base, and this is based on um, assays that we developed specifically for the mouse, and we don't we didn't only sp develop it specifically for mouse. We applied it as well uh, in three different strains on two sexes, and then um, and then in 20 mouse tissues. Um, and we collected the concentration and we put it all in one database. Um, I see here it's a little bit uh, went off here, but uh, the images. But we have three different strains, and they are the the um, 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 the C57, the standard one, and uh, we have one uh, the the severe. Um, um, like one, one for cancer and one for uh, immunodeficiency. And um, so these arrows actually here, the names are, so they are not, nothing to do with the table. But the table is, will show you the, the it's, it's showing here the, the 20 tissues that we, that we um, developed the assays for, and then all the assays were developed according to the CPTAC uh, guidelines, what uh, Rene in the first lecture uh, uh, mentioned so we have five experiment and so stability or interday and intra and intraday um, 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 uh, CV was where we're all uh, determined um, what you see here is the dynamic range that we were able to identify that we were able to see in each in each uh, tissue and you can see that it's a pretty uh, good uh, um, range this is this is a screenshot of the database that we put together and um, this is some information here, what you can see, the different concentration that we, of the different tissue of, for each protein that we measured in, um, um, in the three different strains and the two sexes. So you can, see, you can look at the data in different ways uh, using the database and uh, browse it on the, on the database itself and then try to uh, find what information you need in order to design your new assay or to use which, which assay you want to use in your experiment. Um, we also map it to PTMs and uh, gene ontology pathways as well. You can see in the pathway which, which uh, protein is covered are not, uh, uh, and which one is not. Um, what's interesting here is to map it to um, modification. So mouse is not so as good as, as, as good annotated as a human. So we map it. We map the peptide to the to the mouse to the mouse data, but we also map it to all the human PTMs that is known. Uh, already, um, and just like to give whoever want to use this data and ourselves as well uh, um, um, in advance, you know, some information about um, if it's in, in a human, probably it's also in the mouse or not. We want to target it or not. So this is what uh, what we did in in terms of building databases and building knowledge actually to in order to do targeted proteomics. Uh, um, um, Target proteomics experiment, um, specifically also for clinical application. But we don't also we don't we didn't only develop the databases and put it together. We also applied it in many of different uh, clinical uh, um, um, application. And today I will present three of these studies. Um, there are more than this, and there are some few are going on in the pipeline. But I will present three. The first example that we applied is the intestinal microbiome and venous thrombosis. So it was like the, the, the hypothesis is that um, the, intest the intestinal microbiome composition affect coagulation in humans, speci specifically uh, venous thrombosis. Um, and what we did is um, we did randomized controlled trial for FMT, fecal microbiota trans uh, transplant, and we have healthy donor uh, who trans who 24 who transferred we, we, we did FMT to, uh, to metabolic syndrome patients. And we have autologous, um, which we did exactly the same procedure. So they are not, not these are, it's very important to, to note that these are not uh, placebo. They, are, they got 
FMT, but from themselves. So they are all patients, but they got FMT from themselves. And then what we looked at is, uh, so this is the more or less the, the, how, how the data was collected. We have healthy donor FMT and we have autologous FMT. And we followed them for six, um, we got sample before, uh, before the FMT and six weeks after the FMT. And what we did is we did three, exp three measurements. We did um, the head chip, the human intestinal tract chip. This is like uh, around 1,000 bacterial phenotypes, level three. It is 5,000 specific bacteria um, measurement. Um, um, and then we did uh, absolute uh, protein quantification using MRM with a panel of 270 proteins. And we did also calibrated automated uh, thrombinography, so CATS. So we, this is more or less uh, functional. So what we are looking here at is we are looking at uh, RNA sequencing of microbiota. We are looking at what's happening in the blood um, and level of the protein. And we are looking at functional analysis. And we are try we try to correlate these two to each other, um, and uh, in in the, in the last one, if you are not familiar with, uh, we we look at specific. Uh, so we have blood, and then we do we we attempt to do uh, clotting in it, and then we look at the lag time, time to peak, and and the total area under the peak. So these are some characteristic of this curve. So we determined changes in the microbiome for the, for the healthy donor FMT, but not for the control, the autologous. So the autologous microbiome didn't change as a totality of the microbiome, but in the healthy donor FMT, they, it did change significantly. So that's, that was very interesting. We compared that to the proteomics data. We didn't see on the proteomics data difference between the, um, between the um, autologous and the, uh, the, um, the healthy donor FMT, but we dig deeper into the data and then we found change between the healthy donor FMT responders versus non-responders. So responders is defined, is based on um, a glucose, a glu a glucose disappearance in the blood. So whether they are responders or not, even though their, their microbiome changed, they need to be responders in order to find to have difference in the in the in the proteome level. Um, so, so this was interesting, and the the lag time in the so the, in the functional analysis, the lag time, um, the the functional assay, uh, the lag time of the healthy donor FMT changed significantly compared to the to the uh, autologous. So this is um, this was very interesting. Suggests that actually the um, it's a kind of initial proof that FM, that uh, FMT. Um, or the microbiome affect actually the coagulation. We are now looking into the mechanism and then we are looking actually also in, in doing a validation study. So this was the first example that I wanted to show actually. The second example is, um, is about um, understanding more um, um, how coagulation work in the blood. So we have um, um, a cohort here um, of um, um, people, uh, so um, um, or let me get, let me go one step back. There are a lot of various models for when to give a patient anticoagulant or blood thinner, or and when not. And these are uh, not personalized. So you give it you know, the patient, the, the doctor just decide. Okay, they need to get it. So we got um, um, samples from from um, um, podcast. Uh, um, from the podcast trials. So this is around 3,000 samples which were collected over uh, three years. And we got all, um, um, and, and uh, just to explain how, how, how it was. So here's the sample collection is in the middle and in the, in the, in the podcast with C. Um, uh, so this is cast uh, patients. So the event, lower leg injury happened before the sampling. So their potential of uh, coagulation increased. And in the knee art, art, uh, arthroscopy, so this, this is podcast with, with K, um, um, the event happened after the sampling. So we have, so, and, which, and the, the event will increase the, so it is, it is a risk factor. It will increase the possibility of them getting a thrombosis. And then we followed them for three months um, after that until there's, um, whether there's thrombosis or not. So we, and 23 got, uh, thrombosis in the, 
in the lower leg injury and uh, eight got in, in, um, in the knee arthroscopy. So we got this data, we did proteomics on them or targeted proteomics and we targeted different pathways. Um, um, and we have, again, low, sam low sample volume and high multiplicity. Um, and uh, we looked at the data. So we put all the data together, we looked at it. The first thing that we noticed that there are uh, strong, uh, strong signal when you look at uh, all protein together. The first one was this blue here, what you see here, and that was um, we put in the sample also citrated and uh, K2 EDTA sa samples. So the citrated is different um, than the, K the profile of the citrated plasma is different than K K2 EDTA. So if you are doing if you are doing an experiment, we know now either this or the other. But the other one, which was the strongest signal in the data. It was not uh, that they got thrombosis, it was not that uh, they got exp uh, injury, but it was that uh, whether the, f the ladies got uh, oral, oral, oral uh, contraceptive or not. So that was the strongest signal in the blood. So confounding factor. So we needed to, to deal with that uh, on its own. EDTA and citrated, they correlate very well, but they need, they, we need to, they, you cannot com combine them in the, same, in the same experiment. We learned that also from the experiment. We did the whole pipeline and we identified the, the proteins that we can use to discriminate. And um, if you put them in the model, you get like uh, C, uh, C statistics of uh, around 80% and above 80% of discriminating uh, the people who will get thrombosis or not. So this is a predictive model. So based on plasma, which was collected in the last three months, we can predict that patient can get a thrombosis or not in the next three months. So this is very important for, or very, for, for, for a clinician will be very, very helpful. And we are looking now into how we can translate that into a real predictive model. Um, the third example that I wanted to, uh, to, and the last one that I wanted to show is again about this predict prediction model, and it is done on uh, um, CRC cohort, um, also in terms of uh, venous thrombosis, so you have Cancer and VTE, they go hand in hand. Uh, patients of cancer, patients who have cancer, they die from cancer first, and the second reason for them of death in, in cancer patient is uh, venous thrombosis. So that's very, so they go always hand in hand. And um, um, there are fewer prediction models, what I explained before, and the corona score is the one which is the widely used, and it's actually what you see here, this is from the International Clinical Practice Guidelines, so it is actually suggested in the guideline to use it. And doctors, they use it in the hospital to pr prescribe anticoagula anticoagulant or not. There are a few other that are derived from it, but that's actually the, the model. Um, and the model, what you see here is this is the, just like table, which is showing how the model is calculated is just like score points and then the patient assess these different uh, um, uh, characteristic, patient characteristics, and then they got to point whether it is above, above three or below three or above two or below two, and then they give the anti anticoagulant. And the question was for us, can we do better using um, um, proteomics? Again, we have uh, a cohort and um, with VTE incidents and no VTE incidents, and um, and this is again um, a prospective study. So, so the, the event happened afterwards. We got the samples. Uh, we identified. Um, we did again our targeted proteomics uh, experiment with internal standard. We quantified. So, why we do it always with internal standard? Because that is what we need to do in order if we want to to translate that assay to the clinical chemistry. They want everything with internal standard. They want the results to be in femtomol, femtomol per microliter or nanogram per, per microliter. And that's what we did here. Um, we have our predictors here. And if we put them in the model and do uh, cross-validation and um, we get uh, quite good uh, um, prediction and uh, quite good uh, area under the curve, and uh, what you see here, if, even if you take as low as two of these predictors, you can still get very good uh, C statistics. So even two proteins will be enough to predict whether the patient uh, needs to, uh, to get anticoagulant or not. 
we, comp we, we went further and we, we did the key M analysis and this is just like time to event. So this is kind of survival analysis, but um, in this case, they all, they survived, but it's, uh, it is time to event uh, in this case. And what we compared here is uh, what we call our predictor, we call it the uh, light prot five, so light in prote proteomics five, five based on the number of predictors that we chose. And then we could compare it with corona score um, and, it, and, um, and then we compared it with all others. So what you see here is just depict, depicted in this plot is just like the, the um, uh, confusion matrix here, just like the more green, you want more green and less red. That's what you want in this, in this. and what you see here is the light prot five is, is performing uh, better than other, the others, uh, massively better. And it is not a point-based uh, um, model. It is based on probability. So, we, it's, so it's really 0 0.5 above or below. And the next uh, step for us is validation. And we are currently trying to repeat these results in a second cohort. Um, so this is uh, kind of the message from, or the conclusion from our studies. Why, why, why do you like to do uh, quantitative target proteomics on, uh, with internal standard? It's a multiplex uh, experiment. We can measure more than 100 protein together, uh, actually 200 um, uh, proteins. It's a fast measurement um, compared to ELISA, what they do in the hospital the clinical chemistry mainly. It's low sample volume compared also to, to, the, st to the main standard ELISA reproducible that was shown. Uh, it cost us uh, around less than one euro per protein per sample. That's fantastic. Um, um, it's, um, the assays, there, in the database, we have virtually assays for any protein of interest. And um, also not only if in plasma, we can do it in any, like in different other tissues as well. Um, and then we showed like the prototyping, using quantitative prototyping allow establishing protein signature. I must say that everything what I showed today is actually also microflow, so it is a high flow uh, uh, measurement. So we don't do any kind of nano flow on this, uh, on this results. I'd like to thank my um, colleagues and some of the funding and the institution where this work was done in. And thank you for your attention. If you have any question, I'm happy to answer.